Can you talk a little bit about how we we cover nuclear nuclear issues now? Because the nuclear weapons arsenal is the number of uh, near misses that we've had. You know the accidents where thirty two you know bombs roll over the uh, you know or end up at the bottom of the ocean because a submarine sinks or roll off the deck of the Titan Ticonderoga, and we just don't hear about these things. And now it's like you know it's it's almost impossible to get an editor to bite on a story about uh, nuclear issues. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what your perception of how how the public understands these issues now. Yeah, the other day I'm reading just, you know, a, a, a bit of Charles Lindbergh's son, who's a deep, deep sea explorer. And they're like, oh, he happened to, you know, be the one who, who found um, a hydrogen bomb that had rolled off into the Mediterranean someplace. And I'm like, what? I'm, I'm, I'm in the nuclear world and I didn't know this story and it's casually <laughs> mentioned in an obit I'm like how this is this is <laughs> bananas this is a huge a hydrogen bomb I mean that that's that's like a gazillion times of you know, I mean exaggeration on my part of what the of the Hiroshima bomb was um so yes I it look getting contemporary stories about the nuclear landscape and I speak from experience as a journalist who has tried to place these stories it's a nightmare I, I don't know what the, the roadblock, why there are so many roadblocks to, to getting coverage of no exaggeration here, deadly important stories is. But, um, you know, so for instance, I had been trying um, after when I was in Japan uh, researching fallout, um, I was told about by really well-placed source about um, you know, Fukushima storage of dirty water in Fukushima and how there are hundreds of thousands of gallons of contaminated water that are not being properly or securely stored there. And that they're one tsunami or you know, earthquake away from being spilled into the Pacific or even you know, being qu or quietly released by the facility into the Pacific also. Now I'm thinking, I live on the West Coast. Oh, so there, you know, isn't this kind of an important story for, you know, the domestic U.S. that Fukushima might be, you know, just one disaster away from having floods of, of contaminated water dumped into, into the ocean. I can't tell you how many, I, I couldn't report that story myself because I was writing my book, but I'm well-placed in the journalism community. I, I have to try to recount the number of publications and editors and executive producers and anchors that I contacted. Um, about this story and getting coverage for it, including one prominent um, network anchor who was one of the first into Fukushima after the accident, no dice, could not get coverage for it. And, um, you know, then the atomic, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists recently re released a, a story that, oh, lo and behold, Fukushima is releasing controlled amounts of dirty water into the Pacific now, and there's still no coverage of it. So, you know, I think one of the, um, one of the challenges of, nuclear reporting well there there are two first of all there's you know there's a core of old guard longtime reporters who cover nuclear issues and their editors and they assume that these issues are a lot better known by the public than they actually are i can assure you right now in the middle of the pandemic and climate change nobody's thinking about nukes um and so you know if you bring a story to them they're like oh the broad strokes of the story are already known guess what they're not you know, just because they've attended a conference or a Zoom session or whatever, you know, where they've been updated on the latest, they assume a great public knowledge of nuclear issues. The public does not know. There's an all-time low of public awareness about how dangerous the nuclear landscape is right now. And then, you know, secondly, you know, the news tends to, to, you know, really focus on what has happened already. You know, so if a disaster has happened, we will cover it. But in terms of what could happen, it's, it's harder to get coverage for it. So, you know, the story of, oh, you know, Fukushima is in danger of, of, of having all of its water dumped into the ocean. Not, you know, for, for the urgency is not there for, for some editors who might commission that story. But Fukushima, you know, has another earthquake and all of a sudden a million gallons of dirty water are dumped into the ocean. Suddenly it's a story that is, is covered. And so, you know, we don't have the luxury in nuclear issues of, of ignoring this kind. It's not preventative journalism, but, you know journalism that's told ahead of the catastrophe, because if nuclear catastrophe happens, especially in a nuclear strike situation, there is no aftermath. There is no reporting on the aftermath. There's there's only irreversible catastrophe. Can you talk about the relationship between climate change and nuclear 
uh, weapons, nuclear issues? So the bulletin for the atomic scientists, um, and I, I, I don't have an official affiliation with them, but I do rely on their experts and their board members a lot for, for information. Um, they now dubbed this to be the most perilous existential threat environment um, ever. And, you know, they used to just calculate existential threat in terms of nuclear threat, but now climate change um, is, is a huge part of that. I, I would refer you guys and, and your listeners to, to them because they can elaborate a lot in, in a lot more detail, but accessible detail about the link between climate change and the rise in nuclear threat. Um, not the least of which is, um, you know, climate change is driving um, migration and will continue to drive migration and it exacerbates tensions between nations, you know, who are accepting refugees and who are, expe you know, expelling, uh, expelling refugees. It really exacerbates bad relations. It, it's especially bad if it's between nuclear, you know, between nuclear powers. And so they create, they, the bulletin says that that creates a, a much um, more fraught environment. And then there's the issue of, of nuclear testing. Um, you know, during the Trump administration, you know, our former president was making noises about um, resuming nuclear testing. The, the fallout from nuclear testing has been, you know, much more significant than, you know, is, is widely reported. The environmental impact of that is, uh, you know, is disastrous, especially as, you know, when, when weapons are tested and detonated above ground. Um, but again, this is something that there is much more detail um, through the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and they can they can really lay that out for readers who want to investigate the link further. And the uh, mid 100 seconds to midnight, could you just explain what that means? So the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists um, for decades has had what they call a doomsday clock. And every year at the beginning of the year, they reset the doom clock. And the number of minutes to midnight indicates or reflects um, the perilousness of the of the nuclear landscape in pre in, 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 in peak Cold War. I think that the the closest we ever got to midnight before was was two minutes, and that was I think when in 1953 when the first hydrogen bombs were detonated and tested. Um, and so that that was that was a bad moment. Uh, in the 80s, it surged back close to midnight again. In 2020, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists set the clock closer than it has ever been to midnight, 100 seconds to midnight, which I thought was a curious choice. Like, why not just, you know, put it to one minute? But, you know, that was that's what they chose. It was the kind of announcement that if it had been made not during the Trump administration, you know, where there was such, such a cacophonous news landscape that it would have been a really big deal, that announcement. But it was kind of like nobody, it, it, it kind of fell on, on deaf ears. Um, and it's, it's one of the one of these things that it, it helps illustrate how little people know about the nuclear threat that this group of of experts who include Nobel Prize winning physicists and experts and, and policymakers is trying to desperately alert the world to the fact that we're at this very dangerous precipice, you know, where, you know, nuclear treaties are being abandoned and, you know, there's unprecedentedly bad I don't even know if that's a word, um, but I'm using it as a word. Um, bad uh, communication among nuclear powers, you know, climate change is contributing to um, to tensions. Uh, there's a terrible mismanagement of, of nuclear waste. You know, it, all of these experts are trying to warn in this very dramatic way, and yet it's getting no attention. I mean, it's a very worrisome situation. And I would like to point out also that this reflects the situation that we were in before the pandemic, where we had pandemic experts warning, this is coming. You know, we we you know we have to be prepared with climate change. We've been warned for 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 decades. This is coming. Here's the science. You know, and so at what point do we stop ignoring our experts, our best place experts, and really try to to press our elected officials to find solutions? And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com.